Welcome everyone to the ISM New Jersey webinar series as we welcome new members from uh, members from uh, various chapters, including Charlotte, Dallas, Denver, Den uh, Nevada, Eastern Virginia, New Jersey chapter, and also um, all of our other chapter members throughout the US. During today's event, we encourage you to ask questions by using our chat or a Q&A tab during the presentation. Today, we will be discussing the state of small parcel market post-COVID, where do the carriers go? Uh, working with carriers during COVID, a Crutchfield Corporation case study. At this time, I'm going to turn the program over to Rick Collins, who is the leading supply chain consultant with Partner and Platinum Circle Partners, serving as the uh, Senior VP of Client Services for companies in North America at this time. Um, Rick, you can take the stage. Thank you, Kathy. Um, thanks again for um, uh, setting up this uh, time for us to talk about what's going on in the um, really bizarre small parcel marketplace. And so we have um, myself and I'm a, a, a vice president of client services and then also a partner in the firm of Platinum Circle Partners. And we'll go through a slides in just a minute, but just wanted to introduce to you and we'll talk a little bit more about the, the on our side, I have Tim Geiken, who is the founder of Platinum Circle Partners. Um, and he's gonna be taking us through the majority of this, um, the, the deck today. We, we want this to be open dialogue at the end, certainly ask questions. Um, the marketplace has really been nothing like we have seen in, in history uh, over the last year and a half during COVID and all the challenges that, that companies face uh, across the country. So we hope to, to today's educational at least give you a pulse of what we believe is happening in today's marketplace. So Tim will be take, talking us through that, taking us through the presentation here. Um, and then once I have uh, Chris Grossclose, who is, uh, 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 you can see here on the screen, his background, I won't go into the details, but he's a senior executive at Crutchfield Corporation located in Charlottesville, Virginia. I've known Chris in Crutchfield for probably 20 plus years. Uh, we have helped them in areas of their supply chain cost. Uh, and so Chris is going to be talking about the impact of COVID and how it's impacted um, their company and some of the things that they're in their relationship with the carriers, some of the challenges they faced. And Chris is going to take us through that piece as well. So at this time, um, it's just to keep our time and on schedule. Uh, again, I'm going to ask uh, Tim to take over the presentation mm -hmm. from telling you a little bit more about uh, our company. And then we're going to start right into the presentation with no delay. Thanks a lot again. Thanks, Rick. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. We'll try and be concise and succinct so that we have time left over for any questions you might have. Um, just a bit of background on Platinum Circle Partners. We are a expense optimization group. We have a specific focus on small package programs. Our clients range from organizations that spend as little as a half a million dollars a year with either UPS, FedEx, or the regionals. And then we have more than a handful of clients that actually spend over a billion dollars a year with a B in the small package market space. Um, our clients exist across all verticals and we support them with a combination of critical sourcing, and also technology and expense management tools that are built specific for the small package marketplace. Last year around May, shortly after COVID impacted the market, we had a number of customers ask us, where, where is this going? And in order to answer that question, um, we had to kind of look at where we have been. And we actually built this overview back in May. We've updated it over the last year, but most of it has actually been fairly accurate and is unfolding pretty much the way that we had expected. So what our goal is, is to take you through, in order to know where we are and where we're going, you have to know where we were. And we'll walk you through a couple of slides to help you understand that. First off, Pre-COVID, the way we like to talk about this is if you were the senior executive team at UPS or FedEx, the question was, what kept you up at night? What, what was the primary concerns on your radar that drove both your capital 
decisions and your strategy decisions. And there really were four of them that were the leading planks. First of all, there is, as, as everybody is familiar with, the term last mile has not only become a more popular term, but it has actually a bunch of implications to the traditional carrier networks. And the last mile is not just the last mile of the long movement, it's becoming a last mile with different dynamics, including the idea that inventory is getting much closer to the customer as a result of last mile focus. You have an entire industry of non-asset based competitors that are evolving. And you also have customers asking for additional services to support how they get faster and how the last mile becomes a strategic advantage. Secondly, speed. And if you're thinking about speed in the world of small package, you have to think about speed from coast to coast, as well as speed in that last mile, in that one day, and in some cases, same day. Third was the idea of a seven day network. And you've seen a lot of work on this over the last 12 months, but the, the way to kind of think about this is, if you're UPS, FedEx, or the regionals, there's, there's really a couple ways you can deliver more packages or increase capacity. The, the way you do it without spending money is either you extend the hours of the day that your network operates, or you extend the days of week that your network operates, which doesn't add buildings and vehicles necessarily. The other way is to spend the big billion dollar numbers in CapEx to actually add sort facilities and other items. FedEx is far down the road on the seven day network and we think they have a, a significant advantage today. And as you, if you watch the news closely, both UPS and the regionals are gonna be chasing the, the seven day network with a lot of uh, velocity. And then lastly, it's as complicated as the small package world is, yield per unit is the metric that matters to the carriers. And that is, has a bunch of different components that were part of the carrier focus, including where, where they deliver value into the market and some of the smaller versus larger customer segments. So how do we know that these are the four things that keep them up at night? Well, the evidence is in the things that UPS and FedEx do, where they've been spending their money, and the things they talk about during their investor calls. So you have a bunch of, for example, micro or geo market activities that are going on. Um, if you haven't been exposed to conversations around um, local packages or same day delivery opportunities, these are conversations that the, the larger, um, more prevalent players are having today. They're also looking at ways of building residential density. Now, this was true before the pandemic and e-commerce exploded, and both UPS and FedEx have, uh, from lack of a better term, configured their network so that they can slow down or speed up packages to help build a, a density at a delivery stop or density on route. And then probably the, the one that has accelerated and taken on uh, the most importance right now is the strategies and the execution around small, medium businesses. Small and medium business growth solves the yield per package problem for all of the carriers in the marketplace because they don't command that 4 or $5 rate that some of the larger players do. So there's a ton of activity around both of these areas. In fact, if you think about it, it used to be an environment where UPS and FedEx controlled their role in the e-commerce marketplace through restrictions on the way that you can actually move their label. Now, what they're doing is they're both going deep into the e-commerce workflow with services and partnerships that they're hoping will reposition their value and protect that very valuable high yield per unit 
that comes from the small and the medium-sized customers. Um, and you may have seen, it's not included here, but just about a week and a half to two weeks ago, FedEx, after the shop runner acquisition, announced their strategic partnership with Adobe. And if you dig into it, what you'll see is that the main value of that that's being uh, touted is that post-sale intelligence is gonna become part of a value delivery from FedEx as part of that partnership with Adobe's e-commerce platform. So again, these are the issues that the carriers were focused on pre-pandemic. A lot more um, conversation we can, we can have around that, but essentially they were both focused in areas that were pretty much identifiable. And then the pandemic hit. So we, we wanna be clear on a couple of things that happened and actually, in a, in a minute, I'm going to turn it over to Chris, and he can talk a little bit about the challenges that they face at his organization. But it, there's some things that are real about the pandemic as it relates to the carrier networks, and there's some things that are misunderstood about the pandemic as it relates to the carrier networks. So first, when you look at the top left of this slide, you'll see a 2Q of 20, which is the second quarter of last year versus the first quarter. So in UPS's world, to be fair, they came out of Q1 looking at basically a one to 2% growth going into Q2. And they actually finished Q2 up 14 to 20%, depending on the product. In total, they're up 17%. What that also did, though, is it changed the definition of, quote, at capacity, unquote. And it also changed the definition of peak period. Just to give you a little more context on that, we're, the market's still seeing peak surcharges, for example. But go to the right and look at the first quarter results versus fourth quarter. So in the fourth quarter of 20, UPS was actually up 9% over 2019. That's exactly the growth they experienced in 2019 over 18. More importantly, when they went into Q1, they dropped back down to 80% of what they did in the fourth quarter. So this idea of the networks being at capacity is a function of some other things that are going on. And the question is, are they permanent? Are they temporary? And what do they really mean in terms of service and price headwinds as we look out through the rest of 21 and we start to think about 2022? Um, just as a side note, FedEx is in a little bit of a different situation. Uh, first of all, when they, when they um, peeled back from Amazon, they had a plan to bring their postal hybrid program internal, their smart post program. Um, that plan did not go as smoothly as they expected. And that, the fact that they had to change the network to accommodate no more final mile postal delivery, combined with the pandemic, they have been running at over 100% of what they defined as capacity ever since we actually got into Q1. Their, their quarters are a little different. Their Q3 is December, January, February, so don't, don't let that confuse you. So the second thing that happened when the pandemic hit is that the carriers, although they knew this to be true, they physically experienced something that caused them a bit of a panic. When you look at these slides, they represent different size customers and it represents the service performance by week. On the left where you see in all three cases, the yellow bump that's way, way high, that's May of 2020 when pandemic was pretty much at its peak. The way to think about this is that in both UPS's and FedEx's systems, they are not built to store packages. They're built to pick them up, move them, and deliver them. And it's, it's, a, it's a, not a 
appetizing correlation, but it's kind of like if you have a sewage backup in your home, once it starts backing up, it gets ugly really fast. So once you had a COVID event in a facility or a market and it started to back up, it spread to the rest of the network. What that did is it turned into the carriers taking an action that neither of them had ever done before, which was actually calling customers and restricting the amount of packages that they could ship until they were able to get the network put back in shape. They were successful at that, uh, but I'm gonna talk about the implications of that as it pertains to the rest of this year and next year. But this might be a good time to just take a step back and say, we have somebody on the line who actually lived through this, which is Chris. So Chris, maybe you could talk a little bit about your real life experience and how, uh, a little bit about your organization and then what happened with y'all. Yeah. Um... Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. And and we did. It was a it was an exciting year. It was an unexpected year. I think everybody in, on this can agree to that. But uh, you know, a little background about Crutchfield. Founded in 1974, uh, uh, Mr. Crutchfield started his garage. He is still actively running the business today. Uh, we have a wide variety of products. We still about half the business is focused on car and marine audio. The other half is home products. We have a pro audio line and um, some. Uh, some other product lines, but, uh, um, uh, you know, we, we grow pretty steadily uh, by maintaining our service levels, maintaining our, you know, we two day, uh, two day delivery guarantee in the U.S. And that's all out of Charlottesville, Virginia. That's where I'm located. Um, uh, and, um, you know, we've had a good run uh, so far. And uh, can you go to the next slide, please? <laughs> so, um, you know, our, our growth has been pretty predictable. We're not super seasonal either. We're not a, uh, you know, 80% of our business happens in December. I, you know, we're 20 some percent per quarter and our, usually our, our holiday season is maybe 30, 31% of the year, somewhere in there. So we've, uh, we have the, uh, the ability to plan and um, this caught us, as many people caught us off guard. I had a canned plan if they came to me and wanted to double capacity that we were able to pull the trigger on, which is a capital expense uh, investment in the air primary distribution center to add some pick zones to pick up some of that capacity. But the problem that I was not prepared for is storage space and the additional inventory. Um, we added uh, several tens of millions of dollars to our normal carrying uh, amount of inventory that we carry. And I had stuff tucked in everywhere, rented trucks or rented uh, 53 foot trailers. Um, we're right now getting ready to lease a local facility in the uh, in, in our local mall here in Charlottesville that's empty uh, to get us by until we can can expand our uh, distribution center. Um, so, you know, we, we were drinking from the fire hose, but the, the one thing that ended up being the wisest thing I've seen anybody do is really controlling our volume to maintain our service levels. So through all of this um, activity we had in 2020, we were still offering, you know, order by five ships same day. Um, we weren't overextending ourselves uh, from the standpoint of, we were still able to maintain uh, volume through the call center, uh, maintain our hold times so that that didn't get out of control and just, stay focused on what would still be a good customer experience and harvest as many orders as we can out of out of that situation. Um, so uh, part of this right now, we're, we're doing an active study on where would be a good location for West Coast DC. Um, we've done several of those studies over the years and it's never really made sense, but the, the, the volume bump that we've seen this year kind of puts us in the wheelhouse of, of a good time to take a serious look at that. And so we're, we're cautiously growing infrastructure. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're up where that 2021 is up 10% uh, over last year already. And uh, we're still controlling marketing spend. We're still controlling uh, uh, all aspects of the business to maintain the service level for the customers. 
Um, one thing that helped us out a lot, and this was baked into our normal operating plan, is we do these uh, hub bypass loads out of Charlottesville. So I send a load to uh, Burtonsville, Maryland. Uh, we send a load down to Roanoke, Virginia, and a load to Louisville um, daily. We, do load, we have two distribution centers here in Charlottesville, and we load out all those. And that has helped us um, tremendously in being able to handle this additional volume, maintain service levels, maintain the two-day delivery commitment um, coast to coast. We're running into, you know, I can talk all day. I'll, I'll shut this down here in a minute. But we're running into a lot of supply problems now. Most of our vendors, you know, pick somebody, you know, Alpine, Sony, Kenwood, whoever, uh, are all saying collectively that uh, supply is still going to be sporadic through, through the holidays of this year. And um, we're really asking ourselves, where do we need to land on a capacity storage space and uh, labor standpoint? I've added third shifts. So we're running, uh, normally we were basically Monday through Friday, uh, seven in the morning to about eight o'clock at night. We're running now Sunday through Thursday from seven in the morning to 1.30 a.m. And Fridays, we're still doing uh, 7.30 in the morning to about nine o'clock at night. And we're not running Saturdays per se at this point, but um, anyway. Hey, Chris, Chris, yeah. Chris, a quick question I've had from how how has Critchfield handled the uh, staffing during COVID, and then also um, the care relationships have they all been? I mean, I know that you have great care relationships. Has anything been has changed there from both the trucking and also the small parcel? Uh, not so much on the outbound side. We fell into a, you know, we're primarily a UPS shop. Um, we do some FedEx and we do, I don't know, roughly 10% with USPS, maybe a little bit more than that. And all that's gone fairly well. We've, we've, um, uh, biggest problem we had was, uh, uh back to, uh, Tim's previous slide about the capacity in the, in the network system is on our inbound side is what caught us off guard. Um, so, my facility here in Charlottesville doesn't have a huge trailer lot. And at any given time, I went through <laughs> three, four, five months in a row with 15 or 20 trailers to unload in my DC. I'm, I'm about 100,000 square feet in Charlottesville and, and my other DC locally is about another 100,000 square feet. And so we saw that from an inbound perspective as far as uh, most all the carriers, we had to sign drop agreements because they could not store the product. And it was either we refuse it and send it back, which was not an option for me to do, um, or we, we just keep piling them up in the lot. Um, our outbound did not suffer that bad um, that I can remember. I think we, we, we mostly maintained our two-day guarantee. Um, uh, and a lot of that's predictable. I mean, the business scaled up but we're still kind of our normal format for, you know, I've got my, my main three quarters that are in their 20% and then, then the holiday season's about a 30% bump. And uh, we didn't see anything disproportionate to that aside from the 60 or 70% increase in overall business. So, uh, Great. Yeah. Th thanks, Chris. And we're, we're gonna come back and open up for some more questions at, at, at the end and we'll you know, take us home with this. So, just to, to kind of take us back to where we jumped in yep. is we talked about what hit the carriers network and then really um, the challenges that, that Chris and other customers face were a result of what UPS and FedEx were and were not able to do. But what's really important to understand is that COVID and the impact on their networks had two different dimensions. So one of them was physical, and then you also had an issue with assets. And if you think about it, your ability to run efficiently and run at capacity is really dependent on the physical part of the work and then the equipment part of the work. Well, the easy way to say it is that trucks and sorting equipment don't get COVID. They don't go slower because of COVID. People do. And when you look at the people element of it, Loading and unloading went from two down to one, manual sort operations, the non conveyables where both UPS and FedEx move larger packages to their facility using people and alternative methods. They don't go on the conveyor belts. 
this is the area that actually got hurt. And if you think it through, what that means is that they are still operating in a challenged and limited environment, but it is temporary. We, we definitely know we advanced to 2025 econ levels in the marketplace, but as the physical restrictions start to go away, we expect that the networks are actually going to be in decent position going forward. You then had one other thing that affected both carriers, which was the perfect storm with stimulus. And you know, people have different opinions, um, but it is a fact that UPS is at work because they're a union, and FedEx is not at work. There's, uh, you know, they, they will talk about it. Everybody will talk about it. They cannot get the labor to come in. And until, unless something changes between now and September, this, the issues that we have from a service and a capacity standpoint are gonna hold up until we get to September and something changes. And they are desperately trying to figure a way to get around it. Keep in mind, this is conflated by the fact that a lot of the part-time workforce comes out of the college environment. Colleges have not been back at full force, and now you're going into the summertime where college is not in session. So we're in, we think we're in for a little bit of a rocky, a rocky go over the next, next, couple, next couple months. There's some positive news we'll share in a minute, though. The other thing that happened in the market is really uh, an interesting phenomenon and something that never happened before. UPS is a 115-year-old is company. Carol Tomei was the CFO at Home Depot. She sat on the UPS board for a number of years. She is the first outside CEO that UPS has ever had in its 115-year history. She's also the first woman CEO they've ever had. And she had a very specific plan when she actually came into the, into the organization. Um, in May, if you think about it, if you're on UPS or FedEx's side of the fence, you, your network was in trouble. So you, you told people they had to slow down their shipping and they were coming to you and they were saying, can I pay you more to take my packages? Then when you got to June and July, you started to see that this was not going to abate by December, where you knew they would need capacity, and it turned into a market event where there has been some, some rationalization of customer rates. Um, we have at least seven customers we know of that have been, quote, fired by the carriers. They got a seven-day notice. They either took a increase that range from 15 to 40% in rates, or they went to publish rate with no guarantee of capacity for through the rest of the year. And that threw the market upside down. And it doesn't matter whether it was UPS or FedEx. Those of you that are familiar with the industry know that as goes brown goes purple, and as goes purple goes brown. They mimic each other's behavior in the marketplace. So this is one thing people didn't expect. And if you look at any of the earnings numbers or earnings releases, you'll see, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, you know, one thing that is important to kind of keep in mind is that in December, during peak season of 2019, the networks really weren't running very well either, right? We talk about performance. When we were in, in peak season of 2019, pre-COVID, you had situations where we were running at 80%, 85% for either carrier. So this, these lower service levels are not something that are, are completely unprecedented. So really, the, the question that we came to is coming out of COVID, is there anything long-term that fundamentally is going to change the market and what is going to happen with rates? So the first answer to that question is that we believe that the strategic imperatives that existed pre-COVID are still going to guide UPS and FedEx execution 
as we come out of COVID later this year and into 2022. So the, the fundamental strategies aren't necessarily changing. They may shift some of the priority a little bit on the small customer segment, but the rest of it's gonna stay the same. The economic side of this question is actually not as good of a story. So this is a little busy, but the way to think about this is that as we go through, we came out of 20 and we went into 21, and then we get into 22, there's a number of things that will drive market rates higher. And there's a number of things that will help pull them back down. And let me just talk about the way to look at this. First of all, the red line on the graph represents the lowest value e-commerce offering that is in the marketplace. With UPS, that is SurePost, where it's a hybrid postal delivery. And with FedEx, that's SmartPost, where they've internalized it, but they are delivering slower and creating a lower value service. The black line represents the branded residential e-com delivery. So the, your UPS brown driver always at the door, or your FedEx home delivery driver at your door. Both UPS and FedEx will always maintain a premium or a gap between the two. So the question is, what is the biggest risk to both of these lines moving up? And it is, unfortunately, the United States Postal Service. Because if the Postal Service raises rates, that drives through to UPS's SurePost program. It also creates room for their quote premium branded program. So all expense goes up. On the good news side, we've got three things that are actually helping. Number one, we believe there will be, and we haven't changed this slide from May of last year, we think that the brick and mortar recovery has just started. We have a number of very, very large omni-channel operating organizations. They have to get people back into the brick. So at some point when you're going to charge $9 to deliver something and it's a $30 to a $60 order, the economics start to tell you you need to incent people to come into your brick and mortar where you have sunk costs and ongoing operating exposure. So we think that there is some momentum that's gonna pick up through the month of July and into August on brick and mortar recovery, which will take some pressure off the networks. The second thing that's happened is that some of the carriers on a regional level that might've been quote iffy have got their legs under them. Price points gone up, um, they've got a bunch of capital now and they're actually in it for the long term. We're a little bit suspect of some of the new carriers that are saying that they are regional or national. Um, what we end up finding is when we dig in, mostly they are consolidating and they are dropping into the post office or other regionals. So we would have a note of caution if you've not heard of a quote new regional carrier. The question needs to be, how can you show me your last mile assets are yours? They're either your contracted employees or they're your vehicles. If they're not, then you're, you're opening a channel that is gonna run right into the same um, clogging up come December as everybody else. Let me just talk one, for one more second and we'll stop and, and go into questions. But um, as far as the USPS is concerned, um, what, you may have noticed they just started talking about the 10-year plan. The post office is in a position where there's really only three ways that they can rescue themselves. Um, there is no question that first-class mail, the monopoly product is becoming digitized and it is continues to decrease as a portion of the revenue. Um, they have the pension liability that they're required to pre-fund right now, which is killing them um, on the operating capital side of the business. And they have law that requires them still to deliver to every address on a set schedule. The only remedy for the post office 
and you can talk about it for years, but it's pretty simple. Either they need to raise rates to the point that they can cover the expenses, they need relief from their operating service requirements, they need relief from the pension funding that they're obligated to, or first class mail needs to stop going digital. So on the bad news front, we do think the postal actions coming through 21 and into 22 are going to exaggerate what happens in the marketplace. And let me, before I conclude and we stop to answer any questions, I have one summary slide. Rick, did you have a question you were going to ask? No, it, it, I did get one question here from um, uh, a um, from one of the members here. It's and it was a reference to one we get asked a lot, Tim. Um, this is Am Amazon used to be UPS and FedEx's biggest customer. How soon do you think they will be able? To market their own parcel delivery service head to head with them. And if they do, what effect will it have on the small parcel marketplace right away? So, um, so good question. And it's a complicated one. Amazon is no longer a FedEx customer. Um, however, and the reason for that is they did something fairly chilling. They shut down FedEx shipping. If you were a participant in the Amazon marketplace because of service concerns. So that was an eye opener for FedEx and UPS is that their customer actually started to affect your market and had power over whether people could use your services or not. The second thing to think about when you think about Amazon is that they represent 11 or a little over 11% of UPS's revenue. That's big. Um, you have to ask the question, if UPS turned around and looked in the mirror and said, how did I get here and how do I get out of this? Right now is a time when they have the best chance of getting out of it and moving that low yield, low revenue volume out of the system because they have packages that are higher yield, higher revenue, they can replace it with. It's a one in a lifetime opportunity to unwind something that is very terrible for them. We don't have any, any direct evidence of it, but if you just think it through, it makes sense that this is the time to do it. And then lastly, we have believed all along that the Amazon small package delivery units were always going to be extended to the market in combination with people that participate in the Amazon marketplace. If you're not participating in the marketplace, they would have no incentive to bring you um, small package delivery services. We've worked through a couple quotes with them, not real realistic. And what we know today is that they are hyper-focused on handling everything they can of their own internally because they're overwhelmed with volume. You know, they're overwhelmed like everybody else is. So, um, that, that chapter is yet to be completed in the market, but we don't think in the near term, they will evolve as a direct competitive option that's going to help the market as it relates to UPS and FedEx dominating. And then just lastly, um, what do we see coming in 2021? Same as we thought. Um, I... We, we had said back last year that capacity is going to be the name of the game and that a guarantee that you're going to get your package picked up and delivered, not, not delivered, picked up and delivered, is going to come at a price. That's happening. We know those conversations are taking place. If you want a guarantee for December, November, you're going to pay more for it. We do believe that both carriers are going to continue rationalizing contracts in an organized in a methodical way and they're going to start moving down through the list of customers and looking at post profitability um, and then there's a couple other things that that are pretty evident i think i think you can you can read them and then we also know that the seven day operating network as we get through 2021 is going to be the key for both ups and fedex expanding that the number of days that you can operate so you don't have to add assets and you can increase your throughput it's a no-brainer, and they're both hyper-focused on it right now. So with that, let me stop and see if there's any other questions that we can answer. Hey, Tim, uh, one, one thing that we do get, um, and thanks for that, that overview, um, we get a lot of questions about regional carrier um, 
uh, with uh, Duopoly, with UPS and FedEx. Um, we have a lot of our clients who are certainly looking for other um, solutions to regional carriers. And uh, I don't know if you want to talk to that a second, but certainly uh, whether it's on track or GLS or Speedy or Lasership or Lone Star, um, these, these companies certainly have had um, their hands full with during COVID because they've ended up with more volume than they anticipated. Um, state the obvious here, but that's certainly been a, uh, there, there is a, a growing um, swell of interest in regional carriers. Yeah, there, there is. And it's, you know, it's an interesting scenario because not only, not only do they not necessarily, it's an origin issue, right? If you're not in the geography that the regional operates out of, well, first of all, if you are, they don't always pick up your packages. Sometimes you have to get them to them. And if you're not, the question is, does it make sense economically and service-wise to take the packages to them wherever they are? And then that might be a different, you know, that might be a different answer, for example, for Chris coming off the East Coast, getting the on track in Reno or something like that versus somebody that has a facility in Texas that wants to move things out of Reno. Um, we, we go through a lot of that, those analytics with folks and it is, it is, it's something that everybody is looking at. And if I had to say the, the one thing most people are doing today is trying to figure out how not to depend as much on UPS and FedEx. So they're going through those um, conversations um, and they're not overly difficult, but they have a couple more nuances than you might expect. One other thing that I'll make to note for those on the, on the um, webinar here is that, you know, we are seeing an uptick as Chris alluded to earlier, um, with either 3PL interest to expand, um, you know, their West Coast, East Coast, West Coast, or vice versa. Um, I will tell you through several RFPs that we've been involved in that we have seen an uptick in uh, as much as 15%, depending where you're gonna locate because the 3PLs have been inundated with requests to try to meet the service needs of their clients um, because of um, the, the, the great surge of e-commerce. So just as a point of reference, um, uh, there's certainly uh, opportunities there. Uh, I think Chris and it, they, they've been examining with a 3PL or, or even putting brick and mortar out there. So I don't know if you have any comments on that, Chris, but certainly um, those are things that we're seeing in the marketplace based on the, you know, most folks are at home now. So it's it's um, been a real surge of, of direct to consumer, whether you're a, you know, a crate and barrel or you're a, you're a a, um, a crutch field, you have certain needs trying to fulfill that, and especially also in the food world um, and direct to consumer, we're seeing this real need for um, 3PL um, uh, basically help or distribution to get what most people believe you need it the next day or second day or two day, as, as Chris's crutch field is two day everywhere in the country. And Chris, I don't know if you have any comments there. Either. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've, you know, ideally, you know, we, we focus, <laughs> focus on a really good customer experience and we have wanted to have a West Coast presence. It just hasn't made sense once you get into the weeds on, on diluting your order volume. We've always been better off staying on the West Coast. We're looking at it when, when if we do it, we will do it ourselves. We'll, we'll lease a facility to start out, but we will staff it and run it ourselves so that we can maintain that, you know, order by 5 p.m. Pacific and ship same day or something along those lines. If you, you start looking into some of that with the 3PL, uh, you can't get that same day service out of out of a 3PL without paying an arm and a leg. And so our intent is to do it ourselves at this point, um, if we go do it at all. But, you know, we're fairly conservatively run and we're not just going to go flailing off and <laughs> add a whole other <laughs> distribution center without really taking a good hard look and seeing if we're going to maintain sure. this volume first. Yeah. yeah, one more question. Um, UPS has a drug product and biological sample shipment segment through Markin. Does FedEx have a similar integrated model? Uh, these seem like they could be growth areas for these companies where Amazon doesn't play, at least not yet. Any thoughts there, Tim? Um, good, good question. And the, I guess the, it's a, Right now, one of the verticals that both UPS and FedEx are hyper-focused on is the healthcare vertical. It's a fast-growing vertical. 
Um, you know, they both are touting their coronavirus COVID delivery operations. And we, we have a number of really large customers that are in that segment. They've been not um, completely shielded from some of the price actions in the marketplace, but let's just say they're not, they're not getting as much focus. Um, FedEx has a more, use the right grammar, FedEx is more mature in their operating capability and their penetration to that market than UPS is. UPS Healthcare Services really just evolved starting a couple, three years ago, and they're playing quick catch up. Um, and it is a hyper competitive area. Not quite sure how Amazon plays into that or, or what the implications would be. Yeah, I think, and this is, again, some of these, uh, I just want to, um, if Kathy doesn't mind, I'll, I'll just say if there's questions after um, that you have, we'll be happy to, to entertain and, and discuss. We do have a broad, um, I guess, a broad brush uh, uh, verticals for the, the clients that we serve and help um, in their supply chain costs, but we'll be happy to at least provide some feedback for you in some of these areas that you may have questions. We may not have time to answer them today, but um, um, any other questions that anybody has? I think we've um, um, uh, uh, up to our time limit here, but Kathy, I think I'll flip it back to you. And, and if there's any other questions anybody has, feel free to reach out to myself or Tim and, and uh, even Chris. Chris, thank you for uh, participating in this, um, this uh, webinar today. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. Well, I want to do a huge thank you to Rick, Tim, and Chris for joining us today and sharing this presentation. A lot of good information out here, a lot of up-to-date information, too, to keep us all informed, and we do appreciate you uh, coming today and uh, presenting to us. We will be posting the recording of today's program on our YouTube channel, and we will be sending out the link uh, to everyone to collect your um, continuing education hours. Uh, for those that are doing certification. For our next program, we will be uh, doing 3D printing and it's gonna be a live demo, demo on that on May 26th. So be sure to tune into that program and you can register it on our website. So at this point, I'm gonna close out the program. We're getting thank yous from people in the chat, which uh, we all appreciate. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us today and uh, have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.